good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for having us here. Um, I'm the policy director for the Ocean Energy Association, and it's already been introduced. So I won't be long, but I just wanted to to confirm, indeed, that we are trying to represent the sector as best we can at European level. Um, we have a uh, representing. We have been representing for four technologies, wave tidal, OTEC, and salinity gradient. And the key objective of the association is obviously to get a, a good political framework and a good uh, support framework in, at EU level. One more point we, to help us achieve this aim, we've published uh, earlier this year a vision paper for ocean energy, which looks at technological development, um, the project pipeline, which is key to advancing the industry, and of course, finance and market mechanisms, which leads me to the start of this presentation, uh, focused on funding opportunities at EU level. One of them you probably already know, it's been going on for a few years, it's the NER 300. Uh, it's supposed to finance demonstration projects in the field of renewable energies and carbon capture and storage. Um, three projects were allocated to Ocean in the first round of the NER 300, and one project was also allocated to Portugal, even though it was floating wind, not uh, offshore ocean. There is a next round that's currently going on. The EIB will evaluate the projects, and we expect results from that uh, early next year, probably around April, May. As you see on the table on the left, um, renewables have done quite well in NER 300. At the beginning, it was supposed to fund CCS mostly, and in the end, even the project yet to still see on this table has failed to deliver. So the 264 million euros that it was allocated will be available for the next call to fund probably mostly renewable projects again. There is one CCS project that is still in the run, but it doesn't look too good. Um, you probably know that NER 300 stems from the emission trading system. There is a good potential political appetite for a new NER 300 because some member states and, and some stakeholders were very happy with the results. And there has been a discussion about improving the emission trading system recently over the last two, three years. Part of that discussion led to something called backloading, which was the idea of pushing back the allowances that were to be put on the market to a later stage so they don't overflood the market and decrease the price of carbon. Because any of our ideas um, are based on the price of carbon, so the lower the price, the lower the money that's available for funding projects. Um, in the backloading discussion, there was a potential new NER 600. It has not gone through. The objective was mostly to focus it on steel, cement, heavy industry players to help them achieve a um, level of innovation that they wouldn't achieve otherwise through normal innovation support. Now, even if we did uh, go for a new NER 300, and I mean, the backloading will not provide that, but there is scope for it, certainly in the revision of the emission trading system. There will be a need for uh, a revision of uh, the way it's been designed, namely the enabling of upfront finance has been very key, and the Commission was, was not very certain of this, or at least they were not willing to go this way. But this has proved, uh, has been proven uh, to, to be a really key factor in success or failure of, of the project. And we think there is a need for a better match between the finance tools, namely at the moment a revenue stream based project, and the level of innovation that it is supposed to fund. Because back five years ago, when the project categories were designed, the Commission was very ambitious about what type of innovation they wanted. To give you an example, uh, outside of the ocean sector, in the wind sector, they wanted 15 megawatts turbine. And those of you who are operating in this field as well uh, will know that this is fairly unrealistic at the moment. Right, so the last thing about the emission trading system is outside of NER 300, it also provides revenues for the member state, member state to fund climate change mitigation and adaptation. And that included, of course, renewables. The problem with it is that it's not mandatory, so you can imagine how willing member states will be. The second problem is we have a very low price of carbon, so the general amounts are quite low. And the third one is the economic crisis, obviously, so that member states might be tempted to allocate those funds to other budget areas rather than just promotion of uh, mitigation. So in th there is a fourth point is that, like in Germany, for example, some member states already decided what they wanted to do with that money a while ago, and they already budgeted it. Uh, 
Germany, for example, budgeted 17 euros per ton of carbon. And today the price oscillates between 3, 4 euros. And as you can imagine, the projects you can fund with such a difference of money is, uh, are not going to be the same. So I wanted to move to the bulk and uh, probably the more, the more current thing, which is Horizon 2020. The work program is currently being discussed. It's, well, actually, it's, it's finalized. Uh, we can say it's going to be published on the 11th of December. And I wanted to give you a preview of, uh, of what's in it. So you probably know that there are three priorities across the entire program, excellent science, industrial leadership, and the one that interests us most societal challenges. Within societal challenges, you have a subcategory called secure, clean, and efficient energy. And that's where we've managed to include ocean energy support. And just to give you a rough idea of the budget comparisons, on the third line, you will see secure, clean, and efficient energy. It's uh, budgeted with 5,782 million euros. So it's, it's a reasonable amount. I'm sure we can do something with it. And the way the Commission has structured it is that um, within this secure, clean and efficient energy technologies, you have the field of about competitive low carbon technologies. And in that field, there is a first uh, call for basic research. It's called LCE1. There is one for technology development, one for technology demonstration, one for demand side market uptake, and the last one, which is a bit away from it's the previous ones, it's in a different category, but could be very interesting, is supporting first-of-a-kind commercial scale demonstration projects. So I'm going to go a bit in detail in those, and there are also three other parts that could be interesting for us uh, within Horizon 2020. It's blue growth, which is part of the agriculture, food security um, domain, and then there is SME competitiveness and research infrastructures, but I'm, I'm going to leave those, otherwise I'm going to... Uh, miss my 15 minutes so right so lc1 basic research it's new knowledge and technologies so the idea is to bring and the commission for horizon 2020 works with the trls so it's bringing technology solutions at technology readiness level two bring them to three and four and they're looking at technologies that will be the backbone of our system for 2030 and 2050 uh, the, with the aim of scaling them up scaling up um, technologies that are already developed at laboratory scale. And another good point is that supply chains can actually be included, provided it's helping the technology uh, develop as well. LC2 is about new generation renewables. So you move from TRL 3, 4 to 4, 5. There is a big focus on understanding the risks, not only the technological risks, but also all the others, uh, financing and regulatory. And the EU contribution for these type of projects is in, in the range of three to six million. That does not mean you cannot propose projects that go below or above it, but it means this is the average range that they're looking for. And like the others, there are challenge-based uh, calls, which means you're supposed to have a, a specific challenge, and you're supposed to, your project is supposed to help address that challenge. So I've, I've put down for you the, the two challenges under the LC2. It's the first one for 2014 is develop emerging designs and components. And for 2015, they've moved to ensuring efficiency and effective long-term cost reduction and high levels of reliability and survivability. Now, I'm, I'm gonna read, not going to read through the, old, the entire text, but I just put it up there because I think it identifies very similarly to what the industry has identified, the, the research needs that, uh, that we have, namely reliability, survivability, efficiency, long-term cost reductions. The third one is demonstration, so we move up the TRLs again, bringing technologies from 5.6 to 6.7 with a bigger contribution. And this one is going to be probably the key one uh, to putting kit in the water, uh, possibly even arrays, depending on the price of the prototypes. But um, I expect this call to be, to be quite significant for us. The challenge is to demonstrate advanced full-scale devices in real-world conditions. So I think this is exactly where we want to go. Last, last month we had our conference in Edinburgh and I think every single session uh, mentioned the fact that the industry needs to put arrays in the water in the coming years. So this would be one for, for this. 
And LC4, market uptake, is here to ensure a level of growth needed to deliver EU targets. Uh, it's for existing systems, TRL 7 to 9, but as you can see from the EU contribution, 1 to 2 million, that's not so much going to help you uh, putting kit in the water. It's more about, um, not about the actual technology, but about what about the, enab the enablers. So public acceptance, permitting, one-stop shocks, best practice, things like that, which are also very important. Now, the, the, one, the one that's a bit away from the others is this one, supporting first-of-a-kind commercial-scale projects. And the idea is to establish a facility for making loans or extending guarantees to financial intermediates who, can, who are willing to do that. And this is also very clearly a, a key point uh, because putting equity or debt into a project is fine, but when you have uh, financial guarantees from the European Commission or European Union, then that will help both of the above to, to realize. So they want to de-risk the first, kind, first of a kind investments, scale up the technologies that are six to eight at the moment. And this will likely be available from the second semester 2015. So it's not far immediately, but it's coming soon. Finally, blue growth. Um, two potential interesting calls under the new offshore challenges uh, category. One, preparing for the future innovative offshore economy. Um, same as LCE4, it's more uh, study type, so it's two million uh, per project roughly. So they're looking at support facilities, uh, control systems, and the objective is to assess the most pro promising and sustainable business model. So it's not actually uh, developing technology per se. BG6, Blue Growth 6, actually is more like that. Uh, it's got a nice budget, 8 to 10 million per project. And the idea is to work on remotely executed unmanned underwater operations. So that can be for us, that can be for other industries as well, obviously. The oil and gas sector is in this call as well. I mean, at the moment, the, the work with the Commission is very good, and we have a, a very good relationship, and we hope that most of the identified areas where we need research will be in included in the next work program. Uh, there is a, a final interesting new thing that I wanted to discuss about Horizon 2020 is that two months ago we've been contacted by the Commission, by DG Energy, uh, to discuss a new idea they have, namely to link Horizon 2020 funding with uh, the structural funds. This was forbidden before, so it's now a, a new possibility and the Commission is, is seeking for advice on how to best do it. But you could combine both for the same project. So the idea is to first get in the structural fund uh, request because it takes longest, and then to get your Horizon 2020 um, call answer. And uh, it would help probably do a better use of structural funds because they have not been as well used. The money is there, but often they are not used, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, but I'm not going to go into that. And the Commission will continue the discussions, and at some point uh, we're expecting a guidance document or, of the kind to, to help stakeholders uh, take, take this opportunity. One minute, that's good. The last point, it's not directly related to funding, but I think it's going to be very interesting, is DG Mare, it's the same at, at the Edinburgh conference uh, we did last month. Uh, talk to us about the communication that they're going to launch in January. Now the date is finally fixed, 20th of January. Uh, within that communication, they are calling for an ocean energy forum. And this forum should be a link between the research, the industry, the member states, the commission. So if you want, the, the link between the industry and the regulatory framework uh, decision makers. And we, we're working with them at the moment to see how we best uh, do this, who should be involved in it, and how we, have, uh, how we structure it so that it's actually more than just people meeting each other every six months and with nothing in between. But the idea is very clearly to have uh, strong interactions and to understand the issues and find solutions as well for the deployment. So it's, it's just going to be focused on um, funding specific projects, but it's going to be focused on defining the right regulatory infrastructure so that projects can be funded under that infrastructure. Finally, uh, you might have heard that we launched the technology platform. We're in the process of, of designing it, and we invite candidates. So if you want to join, just contact me. Um, we do that. It's probably going to input in the forum, in the technology section of the forum launched by DG Mari. 
And we, it's the same, the objective is going to be to have a very precise um, vision through a strategic research agenda of the next research topics we would like to have included. Um, we've almost all renewable technologies had a technology platform, the ocean energy sector didn't, and now it does, and we're hoping that it's going to be as successful as the others have for shaping the research needs of the industry. With this, I thank you. If you have any questions, are we are available after that. Thank you very much. So good morning, everybody. Thank you very much to the WAVEC for inviting us to present uh, Kiki No Energy. Um, as it was said in the introduction, Kiki No Energy is one of the uh, three KICS knowledge innovation communities set up by the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. Uh, since I think it is a still a not very well known uh, well, European mechanism, I would like to devote the first part of my presentation to explain a little bit uh, what is Kiki No Energy and to contextualize what I will explain later, which is, I think, the most interesting part. And uh, in this second part, I will speak about uh, opportunities for funding. Uh, new products and services uh, within the Kiki no Energy within the Kiki no Energy program. Okay, um, so uh, why does Kiki no Energy exist? Well, the European Union identified around 2007-2008 uh, that uh, in Europe we are very good at producing knowledge, we are very good at research, but we are not that successful in bringing these research results to the market. So they said, okay, we have to do something about it. They uh, went into a, an exploratory phase where they uh, tried different or investigated different models and they came up with, uh, uh, with an idea of, with the idea of creating the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. Since this was an experiment, they said, okay, let us pick three topics and let's see what happens. One of them was, uh, um, ICT, the other one was climate change, and the third one was uh, sustainable energy. Okay, so they launched in 2009, they, they, they launched a public bid where there were different consortia from all around Europe. They made their proposals, and in the topic of sustainable energy, there was a consortium called uh, Inno Energy that, uh, that I mean, won this contest, and this uh, awarded uh, the consortium in energy, the possibility to have a contract with the European Institute of Innovation and Technology to develop innovation within the field of sustainable energy. Okay, as you know, there are many uh, mechanisms within the European Union to fund innovation, research, and so on. So the kicks are positioned close to the market. We want to uh, fill this gap that uh, so, far has, so far has been present in the uh, European research and innovation landscape. Okay, uh, I think I missed a... Well, uh, I don't know why, I, I cannot see uh, this uh, slide here. There was a very nice map of, of Europe here uh, with, uh, with different partners and here I, I usually explain that uh, InnoEnergy is a European company uh, composed by 27 shareholders. These 27 shareholders are um, companies, research centers, universities, and business schools from all around Europe. Um, they have organized themselves into six different uh, geographical nodes. Uh, the headquarters of this company is in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, and there are so subsidiary offices, regional offices in different countries. Uh, also here in, uh, in Portugal and Spain where we have what we call the Iberian node. Okay, so first, I think first, the difference of Creek in energy vis-a-vis -vis other European mechanisms is that the, uh, the, it's a company, that it has shareholders, and shareholders that have committed, uh, I mean, structurally to push this forward and to get involved uh, really in the, in the activities. Okay, uh, our objective is to become the leading engine, engine of innovation and um, of innovation in the field of sustainable energy. And I would like to devote some time to two keywords. First one is innovation. When we talk about innovation, uh, we'd like we like to say innovation for us is invention plus commercialization. And this commercialization part, as you can see, it's 
underlined and in bold letters. This part is very important, and especially for those of us who come from research and so on, it's the part where we are usually weakest. So that's why we insist a lot. And uh, we have developed an uh, innovation readiness level tool where we do not only consider technology, but also other aspects uh, like uh, market readiness, customer readiness level, um, society readiness level, and so on. So first message for us, innovation is just not technology, it's much more than that. Second thing is, uh, we uh, operate in the field of sustainable energy. For us, sustainability in the field of energy means three things, basically. Reduction of the cost of energy, increase of the operability uh, in the field of energy, and third thing, reduction of the greenhouse, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And all this fo focusing on six thematic fields. So uh, the six thematic fields are uh, chemical fuels, clean coal technologies, renewable energy here uh, comprising solar, ocean energy, and wind energy. Uh, and the others that you can read in the slide, I cannot read it from here, but uh, I think it's maybe not that important. Um, okay, what we do? We basically do three things. First thing is uh, talent generation, so everything which is related with education. Second thing is development of innovative products and services. And third thing is support to entrepreneurs support to creation of uh, new ventures. All these three things are not detached from each other, they are connected through what we call the, uh, uh, through the, through what we call the, the knowledge triangle. Okay, what we do in education? So uh, we have different programs, uh, master programs, PhD uh, school and executive programs. So, f so far it sounds quite, uh, quite standard. Uh, what we try to do differently here is that we do not uh, teach our engineers uh, technology, we also teach them business and we also teach them uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. All our programs are, sorry there's a problem with my presentation, uh, all our programs are international because we think this is a key aspect uh, for our f the future uh, game changers in the field of energy. Our business is global, it's not local anymore. Uh, second thing, and I will explain a little bit more in, the, in detail, is the development of um, innovative products and services in the field of energy. I will leave this for, for later. And the third thing, as I was saying, is support to entrepreneurs. So people, engineers, business people that have uh, ideas to create new companies in the field of sustainable energy, and we help them here in four dimensions. Uh, one is technology, of course. Uh, but we also help them with markets, uh, bringing the first customer, funding finance, and supporting them in the human uh, aspect. Not only with, uh, not only with uh, education, but also uh, building uh, complementary teams, which is very important for uh, business creation. So in this, in this particular field, um, we are supporting more than 50 uh, ventures from all over Europe, and uh, eight of them at the end of 2012 uh, became well, were qualified internally f uh, by ourselves as uh, startups created because they had either uh, had the first sale or they had raised investments for more than a half a million euros equity. Again, there is a problem with the slide. Uh, we have how we are funded. Uh, we have uh, ten different uh, revenue sources. We have our uh, partners that contribute with both cash and in-kind uh, contributions. We have a very important funding coming from the EIT, from the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. Uh, this year, 2014, we are expecting to have around uh, 70 million euros uh, funding. And uh, for the future, we have, uh, we have also implemented some mechanisms that should contribute to make uh, the kick in energy financially sustainable. Uh, as I said before, we are a company, we are a for-profit company, but a company uh, which has decided not to uh, distribute dividends in case uh, profit is produced. So all the, all the profit that we produce, we want to reinvest it in more activity. Uh, okay, so this is how our uh, funding uh, uh, perspectives uh, look like so I th it's quite uh, we are fulfilling the plan and uh, for the next years uh, we think that we will be able uh, to to fulfill these figures that uh, you see on the slide 
uh, especially now that the Horizon 2020 has confirmed uh, the budgets and, and so on for the coming years. Okay, um, now I would like to devote some uh, time particularly to, um, to our program which is devoted to uh, funding new products and services, new innovative products and services in the field of sustainable energy and again of course within the field of ocean and offshore wind energy. Okay, what is for us, uh, what is for us uh, a, an, an innovation project? So for us an innovation project as I said before is the transformation of existing knowledge into marketable products and services. This has to be related uh, with, uh, this has to, at the end of the day, it has to aim for uh, these four objectives that uh, I have mentioned before, so decreasing the cost of energy, increasing operability, and reducing greenhouse, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. I'm, I'm very sorry, but uh, the slides are not, are not okay. Um, one of the uh, one of the particularities of this um, of of this program is that we are focusing on quite high TRL, TRLs. So uh, for us, uh, in order to start with a kicking energy project, um, the, the I mean the technology has to be above TRL four. So meaning that the proof of concept has been achieved at least at laboratory level. Uh, this this uh, program is open not only for um, current partners of Kik Inno Energy. It's also uh, open for newcomers. People that are interested in joining Kik are welcome. I cannot go into the, into the details, but uh, just let you know that there are different uh, types of affiliation to Kik to Kik Inno Energy, and depending on this, there are different rights and obligations. So there is a group of uh, partners that joined. Uh, three years ago, and that were the ones that created Kicking Energy. But uh, continuously, there have been new partners that have been joining the program. And for the future, it's also open to excellent partners, to excellent ideas, to excellent projects. Okay, so um, how to participate? Eligibility criteria. Um, well, in order to, to uh, present a, a proposal within our program, uh, as I will mention later, there, are, there is a specific uh, website where you can download uh, all the information and all the details related to the call, but I would like to mention some specific, some very basic things. So first thing is the goal of the project has to be to develop uh, an innovative product or service in the field of sustainable energy and very important with a market opportunity. If there is no market opportunity, even if there is a product, we will not find we will not fund it. This is uh, this is extremely important. Uh, second thing, projects are uh, done uh, on the basis of open innovation, so collaboration is required, and here we enforce that there is international uh, collaboration. Since the goal of these projects is to develop products that will be uh, marketed. We think uh, that the, the smaller the consortium, the better. So there is a minimum number of partners, three, but there is also a maximum seven. So this, I think, it's quite different from uh, other uh, collaborative programs within, uh, within uh, the European Union. And of course, uh, the, uh, the proposal has to fall within one of these six thematic fields. Um, these are the uh, criteria that we use for assessing, and as you can see here, uh, we are considering uh, business, uh, risk assessment, uh, and many other things I cannot read from here, but I'm sure you can do. Okay, uh, we have developed some roadmaps uh, where we specify what uh, we would like to support within these six thematic fields. Um, these roadmaps are based on the very much based on the set plan, uh, but I would say they are a subset of uh, of many uh, technologies that are identified in the set plan. We have taken the set plan as a starting basis, but we have worked with our uh, I mean with our experts from uh, research from business, and we have picked up those uh, technologies that we think will have more impact on the market. And again, as I said, you can find these uh, these roadmaps 
on this website uh, that you can see here. We have a call which is open uh, right now. It will be closed on uh, December 1st. So there is, uh, I think, those of you that, that didn't know about this, there's, I think there's practically no time uh, to join. But uh, there will be two new calls uh, next year in 2014. So the first one on the first half 2014 will open on uh, February 1st and will be open till uh, May 31st. And we are also planning to do some uh, roadshows uh, not only in Iberia, so not only in Portugal and in Spain, but also in other countries where Kikin Energy has um, has some uh, branch offices. Okay. Uh, I just would like to show some examples uh, of uh, projects that we are supporting now uh, currently. These are related to offshore wind. So there are different, uh, different, uh, I mean, different projects. Many of them related to increasing uh, operation and uh, improving operation and maintenance, reducing cost of operation and maintenance for offshore wind farms, and some others that are um, related to uh, ocean energy. For example, uh, this new uh, wave energy converter that you can see uh, in the middle of the, of the slide that is aiming for. Uh, cost of energy of uh, 10 euro cents per kilowatt hour. I'm finished. Thank you very much. Good morning and uh, thank you the organizers for the invitation. I would like to uh, share with you this is the main purpose of my uh, presentation, to share with you some uh, ideas, some information about the role of the structural funds, the European structural funds, in financing concrete projects, concrete initiatives in the field of energy. Let me start by the good news. I'm not going to share with you a very detailed presentation on how we are going to work in 2014 to 2020, because we are not yet at that stage of the preparatory work for that, those uh, programs. But nevertheless, let me start with uh, some uh, good news. And the good news are that in last week, the European Parliament has finally approved the political agreements reached in the trialogue among the Parliament, the Commission and the Council on the domain of the structural funds, the cohesion policy funds, that is the regulatory, the legal framework necessary to start up the programming designing of the operational programs of the future. What we can expect now is that uh, in the beginning of next week, you know, next year, the different uh, member states are uh, in uh, the whole uh, dimensions of the, the requests to start the negotiation process with the European Commission to deliver in a couple of months what is called the partnership agreement, is the, the global agreement to use, to uh, organize the application of the tract on funds in each uh, member state. Therefore, the programming work for that uh, application of those uh, relevant financial resources in each member state is, uh, we can say, previous due to the second semester of the next, uh, next year. It goes without saying that for a country like Portugal, those financial re resources are a critical uh, financing resource for our own public structural policies. Those are very relevant, very significant sources of financing for policies like R&D, like innovation, like uh, even 
uh, labor markets, active policies, like education and so on and so on. So therefore, even though there are many other sources of financing in the public domain, we heard uh, a few minutes ago talking about Horizon 2020, which, which is obviously a very relevant uh, of those uh, uh, sources for a member state, for a country like Portugal, we cannot forget the relevance, the importance, the share of those specific funds, more, uh, I would say, more uh, global, which are the European structural funds, but, but for a specific country like ours, a very relevant, a relevant one. So, um, what I'm going to, to show you is a global perspective of how the work is, uh, is, uh, uh, is nowadays uh, done and what kind of stage has we have pursued until, until now. Now I must say that there are also uh, not such good uh, uh, news, some bad news, and the bad news that, are the, that I cannot show you in a detailed way, like uh, how my colleague previously done, have done in the Horizon, uh, Horizon 2020, a very detailed and concrete measures to support each field of public policy, policy as I would like to, to, to know. Um, First of all, let me start with the starting point. We are talking about uh, global financing resources for what we can uh, call a social economic program, a medium term social economic program. So the first question is how to put the money in such a large spectrum of intervention. And the first issue is to show that uh, there is uh, a place, there is a, uh, an important role to play in some specific sector, which is the energy sector. That is what those figures want to show. As uh, this is not new for anyone in, the, in this room, but uh, we must start by a clear definition of what are our national constraints, which are the main the objectives of such uh, global um, intervention programs. This graph points out the fact that Portugal is one of the EU member states with the highest level of energy dependence. And it makes the point that there are a need for public policy to overlap the situation and this needs a very strong uh, political poli uh, public policy. Uh, taking only the year of 20, 2011, for example, what the, the graph show is that more than two thirds of our final consumption must be bought uh, abroad. Another way to, to show this, to show the, the the relevance of such an intervention is to, to talk about some figures, financial figures. The bill of uh, the, the, our energy dependence is growing. It's a very strong one and maybe the, the more significant figure is to say that, that uh, for our um, deficit in our external balance of goods, one third is due by this uh, specific uh, domain. This must show us why this is important to have a specific allocation of resources in such a uh, domain. Uh, the second uh, starting point, I can say it like this, is that uh, we have already a clear definition that our problem is the energy field is not only a financial or budgetary one. That there are many other uh, perspectives that show us that uh, this is really important to take care of this, uh, of this uh, domain. 
And this is nowadays clear defined in the general uh, documents, the general strategic documents, either from the European Commission, the European level, either from the national side of one. We have uh, lots of uh, strategic documents at European, at European level and also at the national level. We don't need as a first priority to set a general approach, a strategic approach on what has to be done in several domains of our intervention. So the question is more and more to go to the concrete terms on how public policy can intervene to uh, overlap our main constraints and to show some concrete directions to the, the whole uh, domain of stakeholders, public and private ones, that share those uh, opportunities to, to intervene in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this field. So uh, we don't have uh, not any more a need for um, much more elaboration on the strategic way, but we need to, to put in concrete terms to have concrete political um, measures to, to operationalize, to concretize that those, those strategic um, aims or goals. And one of the, the main issues on this, uh, on, on this side is to look for the financing sources for uh, public or semi-public uh, public, uh, policies. That's what I would like to stress on this, on this slide. The, on, specifically on the, the programming period, the, the programming work for next period, 2014-2020, there are already some specific and uh, definitions, much of them coming from the global agreements made on the European level. What we know now is that we have some specific thematic objectives that all the funds must pursue. So we cannot uh, create another objectives. We have a specific set of 11 thematic objectives. One of those is uh, what is written in the slide. Like others, I cannot see it from here, but I, I expect that you can, can do it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so one of them is that uh, formulated in that uh, very general way, supporting the shift towards a low carbon economy in all sectors. Too general, one must say. But specifically in what concerns the priority investments and the investment priorities, uh, like in the thematic objectives, which represents a set of predefined uh, priorities, uh, which uh, not, does not allow that each member state can be, uh, more, can be creative on this field, in the, the domain of the investment priorities, there are also a number of um, priorities which uh, must be, must kept our attention. The first of one is to promoting the production and distribution of renewable energy resources. That's, I would say, this is what matter for us today. Um, our work in Portugal, in the, the program development process that we are nowadays uh, uh, taking in, 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 in count, is to translate those general thematic objectives and those also general investment priorities in concrete public policy measures to support the, the intervention of the next uh, seven years, which are what I can show you for the moment, which are the main ideas for those uh, concrete measures, mainly on two 
directions, two general um, directions, which are nowadays discussed with our partners in the European Commission, but does not represent any problem at, in the, the, at the stage of the, the global uh, definition. The first one is to have a clear measure to finance the production of technologies that have passed their stage of maturity. What does it mean that we are uh, putting in place some concrete measures, some concrete programs to fulfill those aims that are um, uh, represented in this, uh, this slide? What are the significant examples of the, that kind of intervention? Those who are uh, written there, so thermosolar, solar photovoltaic, biomass, biogas upgrade and injection of biomethane into natural gas system. So some of those are what which are being conceived in this uh, first dimension of uh, the operational programs. The second one is the second set of interventions is about technologies with great potential but still under development or demonstration and high costs. So for the first time I would say we can have in the next programming period a specific domain of intervention dedicated to such kinds of uh, uh, public support in those um, kinds of uh, um, technologies. The, the examples are, um, are there. We are talking about wave and tidal energy. We are talking about offshore wind energy and so on. So this is the opportunity, I would say. This is what we can share for the moment, I would say. But I must say also a, a final word on, uh, on this. The, the whole programming period of 2014-2020, what, in what concerns the structural funds, but I would say also in other European funds, like the Horizon 2020, is led by uh, specific words of programming for results. And uh, the global idea of the partnership agreement that each member state is now a days negotiating, discussing with the European Commission, and which will be in place sometime next year, is a concrete contract which defines money, funds, resources, and also results to be presented. And this is a responsibility of, of course, the national authorities of each member state, but also as all the stakeholders, public and private ones, that in each phase of the process are going to assume some responsibilities in the execution of those, of those resources. Um, the objective is to have in specific field, in each specific field of intervention, a clear identification of the expected outcomes and clear measure of how to to uh, uh, represent them along along the time, in 20, in of course in the uh, in the 2017, 2018, when each member states must to present the intermediate reports to the European Commission. But I would say, in the most general way, in every uh, year of the execution of those uh, European European funds. Final words to say that we are, as you can see, in a very uh, preliminary stage of programming for the, the next um, period, 2014-2020, of our uh, operational programs. But this is the time, this is the concrete moment for in every, in every sector, in every set of stakeholders, 
to come with those with the uh, arguments, with their arguments, to share those their opinions and to contribute to 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 to, to the, the whole programmation of the operational programs. This is the time where those kind of measures are going to be designed, and this is the time that. Uh, all of you in this room can have this, those, uh, their own share of responsibility in the, the, the designing of uh, the, the future programming period. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I have to be a bit careful because we're so close in a room here together, Netherlands, Portugal, but there's still an hour difference, but it must be afternoon now. Um, thank you, WAVEC and the Dutch Embassy for organizing this event and giving ING the opportunity to talk about financing and particularly financing in the field of renewable energy and even more with a specific focus, focus on offshore. Um, as said, um, ING is still a global commercial bank active in uh, many financial services and products. We have specialized industry desk and one of the important sectors therein is energy. But for instance, we also are active in the field in telecoms or oil and gas transportation. I myself am responsible for EMEA, as was said, but we have sister teams in New York covering the Americas and a sister team in Asia covering Asia. Um, ING uh, has an ambition to play a leading force in a transition to a low carbon economy. And we would like to work with our clients, clients to drive um, our environment and our economy to a sustainable world. Well. Um, the dedicated structured finance power and renewable desk consists of 15 professionals with a very diversified background. We have technical engineers, we have people who are specialized in finance or economics or in law. And where we have local people on the ground, as in Portugal, where we still have an operating branch, we work together if there's a project, for instance, in Portugal, with the local people on the ground. So we can combine local engagement, local knowledge, with really specialized uh, sector expertise. 80% um, of our business is actually still traditional, long-term, non-recourse project financing. Next to that, we may get involved in, for instance, a bridge loan to a bond takeout or a more hybrid a type of financing, which may be a combination of a straightforward corporate loan met underneath, for instance, a large um, investment or CAPEX program. Um, ING works a lot with multilaterals, like the European Investment Bank, the Export Credit, credit Agencies, but also, for instance, the EBRD. And those institutions are still very fundamental in getting the financing for projects in the area of renewable energy, particularly where it pertains, um, for instance, big new technologies like offshore wind, or maybe even more um, um, earlier stage technologies as well. Um, our global energy portfolio within ING is roughly 3.5 billion euros and one third uh, used to be already spent in renewable energy and we have uh, and we are heading to a portfolio which will consist roughly 50-50 split renewables and conventional power. Um, this is an overview of recent transactions ING has been a leading financial player in. Um, you will see that mainly to date, 
uh, it's a combination of PV solar, onshore wind, and in the recent years we uh, really got involved in offshore wind energy. Um, for those who are maybe a little bit less familiar about project financing, in project financing the aim is actually to finance a single asset or a portfolio of assets on a ring fence non-recourse basis, meaning that there is financing on the operating company but the, um, the debt does not rely on any further guarantees from the sponsors slash investors. Normally the operating uh, company, for instance an offshore wind park or a PV solar proposition, will get the money from the banks or the lenders on that level. Um, the operating company is the entity who uh, enters into the important um, contracts like the construction contract and the O&M contract. Um, the ING does take construction risk. Um, there may be financial institutions uh, who cannot actually uh, work with construction risk and can only financing uh, come into the financing post construction. Um, our clients are, or the sponsors or investors here, are traditionally independent power producers, the bigger utilities, and a lot of equity or renewable funds. We as banker, um, we are actually very simple, there's no upside for us. In the end, we just want our debt to be repaid on time and as scheduled. Um, the uh, security in the financing will actually consist of a full comprehensive security package where basically the lenders take security over all assets in the project including the contract. Um, basically those financings traditionally were done based on long tenors, matching the duration for instance of the support regime and matching the duration of the offtake or the power purchase agreement. Um, the financial world is under uh, increased regulation and Basel III, for instance, does put some pressure on uh, the capabilities of banks providing long tenors. Um, and actually long tenors do match those propositions very well because if a project is up and running then actually they, uh, they really um, guarantee uh, long stable cash flow generation. Um, due to the long tenor discussion you see that banks are actually uh, looking at an option that we still do the long tenor traditional financing or we still have a long amortization schedule underneath it, but the legal tenor we shorten. Um, we call that a hard mini perm. I don't think it has anything to do with the hairdresser. Um, we also have the soft mini perm variant, where basically you still give a long tenor, but somewhere down the road you introduce cash sweeps or maybe a margin step up to increase uh, the refinancing predictability. Um, in general, renewable energy project financings uh, do represent a construction phase plus an O&M phase. Uh, construction in PV solar and onshore wind is actually very short periods. When we move to offshore wind, we really getting into the three years uh, construction periods. Um, the main risk um, banks will be looking at is indeed the construction risk. One of the uh, hot items in the offshore wind energy is that we see a lot of multiple contracting um, which actually opens up uh, the risk of interface. Banks very much rely on proven technology 
So when we talk about wave energy, um, I don't think yet uh, we are there to really enter into the territory of uh, commercial bank financing, but we believe that it will come. We also need reliable and sound O&M contractors and contract. We also look at the resource availability risk, so the wind, the sun, um, but in general, I think banks and all relevant stakeholders, uh, based on 10 years knowledge and experience, and improved wind studies, sun studies, etc., we have made a lot of progress there, and actually the real risk there has quite reduced. We look at legal risk, and obviously we look at the business and market risk. But the most important risk in renewable energy is actually the regulatory risk. We as bankers, but you as investors, you as developers, we can only make this work when there is consistency and uh, faith in a regulatory framework which is there to stay. Our industry, including the financial side, we cannot live with unexpected retroactive measures. We can deal with volatility, but we cannot deal with uncertainty. And unfortunately, on back of the economic situation in Europe, we have had some bad examples which have put the renewable industry actually a little bit in a setback. Um, if you look at the offshore wind industry uh, today, actually six gigawatt is operational today. Most of those parks were actually financed either by the utilities themselves or on balance sheets and not so much on non-recourse project financing. Non-recourse project financing is coming now to the market, now the industry matures. And, um, there is still a very big ambition in light of the 2020 targets we heard before, but it's fair to say that there is a lot of delay and um, the projects and, and, the, and the targets seem quite ambitious. The key challenge is that we need to get the cost down. Yeah? If you look at the AU ambitions, it's all about security of supply and bringing the cost down. Unfortunately, actually the cost of offshore wind energy have come up, where actually the cost for PV solar and onshore wind have come down um, incredibly. The reason, uh, the main reason that the cost in offshore wind have come up is that the projects are further away from the coast and that there is still a lot of R&D and new evolution and development in the wind turbines to get the higher efficiencies. Um, as said, um, ING really wants to be a leading force together with their clients. If you look today at the wave and tidal industry, there is a clear ambition set that 2 gigawatt in 2020 should come from that. And uh, Portugal, like Ireland, the UK, France and Spain, um, are really uh, the main drivers behind ocean energy. Also, big names and large companies do get involved. If you look, for instance, also at the UK, there is a very uh, generous um, uh, subsidy system in uh, place which allocates five renewable obligation certificates, the so-called ROCs, to uh, wave and tidal energy projects. That compares roughly to below one ROC for onshore wind. Um, in conclusion, ING believes that renewable energy is here to stay and that we will need funding from all types of sources. Um, most important, as said, we need to get the cost down. Um, ING uh, would like to continue to be a leading force and work with all relevant parties, players in this industry. And um, where we are now very busy in offshore wind, we believe that in the coming uh, 
the period of years, we will also move more to the wave energy technologies. Thank you for your attention. Alex, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. I will try to be brief, as I know I'm, I'm the last speaker before lunch. And from the people coming from the Netherlands, it's already 2 p.m., so I see some, some hungry faces over there. So um, we've been uh, hearing today several speakers talking about which are the, the EU support mechanisms to boost R&D in the field of energy in order to, to achieve the EU targets by 2020. And, and these support mechanisms such as set plan and, and the um, Horizon 2020, uh, the kick in you know, energy mechanisms, and also national ones as, as the as CREN in Portugal. And uh, in all of them, there's a clear focus on innovation and industry involvement in, in those uh, R&D projects. So SI Ocean is a, a, a collaborative project funded by Intelligent Energy Europe and uh, aiming to unite with the wave and tidal uh, industry in order to have a common agenda for the future in order to, to be able to, to move forward in, in the market development. So the questions SI Ocean is trying to answer are the ones that you've, you've, you can, can read there, um, which are the questions that the policymakers are normally questioning. So which is the real, realistic contribution of wave and tidal energy for the future EU energy needs? And so here we have to identify which are those areas that are uh, more uh, attractive for developing the first projects, which may not be the ones that are more energetic. Also, which is the sta stage of technology maturity? We've heard that today in several uh, presentations as well. So which are the technology priorities in order to mature and, and to move forward? Also, an important question is, is really wave and tidal energy going to be competitive? And to answer these questions, there's a bit of research in this project, and especially focusing on how are we going to, to bring the, the cost down. And as well, a review of which is the status of the policy today and which new policy mechanisms we should be put in place in order to, to move forward. So the, the project is, is uh, focusing on three main areas of work, which is resource assessment, aiming to develop production projections by 2020 up to 2050, and, and realistic ones. We've seen some, realist, some targets in the past which may be too ambitious, and now um, the sector has understood that in order to move forward, we have to, be, um, to put realistic targets that are achievable in order to, to bring the confidence. Also, to look in technology, uh, we will look in, in technology assessment, assessing which is the state of maturity and ultimately to, to bring a strategic technology agenda in order for the policymakers to put the, the correct R&D mechanisms in place in, in the correct areas. And finally, also looking at policy analysis and market de uh, development uh, in Europe to bring a market deployment strategy in order to boost market uh, growth in the future. There are seven partners participating in this project. Two of them are uh, industry associations, such as the Ocean Energy Association, but also the Renewal UK, which is the, 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 the Renewal Association in, in, in the UK. And five research centers, uh, which are bringing the, the, the sound research, such as Carbon Trust, Wavec, DHI from, the, uh, from Denmark, the joint, the joint Research Center from the European Commission and the University of Edinburgh. But of course, this project is aiming to unite all the industries, so We've got a, an advisory board with a representative of the industry, and not only the industry, also um, funding uh, entities such as the European Investment Bank, and also we've got observers from the, from the European Commission. And also a, a very large uh, number of uh, stakeholders have been engaged in the consultation process with interviews and workshops that has been going along. The audience of this uh, project is the policy makers from the national governments and, and uh, the European, uh, at the European level as well. But of course, the output of this project will be, uh, will be also interesting for other stakeholders such as the, the, the financial guys, uh, the technology developers, supply chain, local authorities and so on. And it's focusing on six uh, countries 
that you can see there, so Ireland, the UK, Portugal, Spain, France and, and Denmark, but of course the recommendations will be also very interesting for other countries such as the Netherlands, Germany, which have actually been involved in all the discussions. I don't have much time, but I will go through some of the outputs that are uh, that are already available and you can download all the documents online which are freely available. But of course the final deliverables will only be produced uh, in, the, in the next year, early 2014, which will be the strategic technology agenda and the market deployment strategy. In terms of resource assessment, I already said that the, the final goal is really to produce realistic production uh, projections for 2020-2050. And to do so, DHI, which is the, the Danish Hydrology Institute, has been working on, a, on an interface that allows the user to put a, a number of layers, starting with wave and tidal resource, but not only, also bathymetry, where are the ports, where is the grid, um, the grid connections, uh, where are available, uh, conflicts of use with maritime tra uh, traffic, fisheries, uh, subsea cables, and so on. So that the policymakers will be able to identify which are those areas that are available and have the, the appropriate um, conditions in order to move, not only uh, in the long term, but especially uh, in 2020. So those sites which maybe are closer to shore uh, and have already grid connection, even if it's not the, the, the best sites in terms of energy, might be the most suitable to, to develop first. In terms of the technology assessment, several reports have been already made. One is the, the, the state of the art report, then the cost of energy report and the gaps and barrier report, and the final one which we're working on it is the strategic technology agenda. So the state of the art report is really, uh, as the name says, state of the art, so it's looking at which is the stage of maturity of the different wave and talent technologies, but also looking at how um, these technologies are converging and are evolving, looking into new materials, into new uh, installation and operational maintenance uh, strategies that these companies are following, and so on. Sorry, it's not working. The oh, yeah. The second report is the cost of energy report. So basically, it's an update. You've seen probably uh, most of you this this learning curve already, but now is is an update looking at the, the actual data from the first arrays that are being uh, developed in, in the north of Europe, and uh, especially focusing on how are we going to be able to move this line uh, down you know, to achieve competitive level of uh, LCOE. So it's giving recommendations on uh, specific areas where uh, there's a biggest potential for cost reduction. The third report, the gaps and barrier reports, has been looking at um, which are those uh, critical uh, technological barriers so, and, and which are the technical priorities in order to move forward with the technology. And of course all this information is feeding into the strategic technology agenda that is being developed at the moment. The final area of work is the policy analysis and market deployment. Um, so our first deliver was, was published looking at the, at the conditions in the six member states uh, which feeds into the market deployment strategy. I will go through some of the, uh, a summary of some of the conclusions. So it's looking at really which are the strategic plans that are in place in those countries and also uh, if there's strong political will or not to develop ocean energy in, in those areas. It's also looking at the actual uh, financial support mechanisms in these countries uh, in terms of market pool mechanism or technology push. So you've got the example of the UK that has been already been said today with a very strong uh, support in terms of market pool with the ROC system now evolving into a feed-in tariff type system, but also with strong technology push support in order to, to move forward with technology development from prototype, uh, first array demonstration and so on. But also you have some other examples, such as, for example, Portugal with, with a fewer uh, financial resources, but which in the past has been able to, to bring projects uh, into the water with a, an attractive feeding tariff uh, mechanism, together with some uh, financial support mechanisms um, to capital support. Um, and also, for instance, France, which is a newcomer in, 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 the, in the ocean energy sector, but it's coming with a lot of uh, um, financial support, uh, technology push, uh, not so much into, into market pool mechanisms. 
And as well, this report is, is looking at, at the planning framework and, and leasing process. So which, which are the, the um, uh, how all the consenting and leasing is being done in different countries, if there's any uh, a single one-stop uh, one shop uh, process, or if it's involving uh, multi-agencies and, and it's taking longer that, than expected. And the project is getting to the to the end at the moment, but uh, as, as I said, there's been a lot of uh, engagement from the stakeholders, not so much uh, from from uh, Portuguese or, or or Dutch companies, but there's still place to 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 get uh, to be involved. We are working now on the strategic research agenda and market deployment strategy, and we will be very happy to to get you involved. And, and so, to do so, please contact me or or, or Hemas and Bruno, which is. The, the coordinator of this project or any other of the partners which are involved and you have it on the slide. And uh, as I said, all these documents are available online, so please take a look and, and see if, if you find it interesting. Thank you very much.